Last time, we finally managed to supply our base with bots to botch up our broken bastion with boulders and build back blown up bits before the biters bust through again. Bice. But can we finally take the bime to peacefully and balmly improve our base and properly solve some severe subtlenecks? No we can't. Bite revolution is quickly rising to dangerous levels and they will make more and more frequent expansions, putting indestructible biter bases all over the map and possibly onto our external resources. Now that the base is safe, we need to go out and claim those resources ASAP before it's too late and we are physically unable to do so anymore. So the only thing we allow ourselves to do in the base is to set up some quick and dirty oil cracking to prevent the system clogging up with light and heavy oil. We simply cannot afford to switch back to the inefficient basic oil processing as our oil source is very poor. Afterwards, everything we do is with the intention of claiming resources outside of our base, starting off with making more electric engines and bot frames here in our temporary setup. We also start barreling some oil, which we will need to start up the first flamethrowers out there. Meanwhile, we grab ourselves some walls, set flamethrowers, and we make rails and a train? Can it be true? Will there finally be a train network in one of my playthroughs? Anyway, meanwhile my iron supply line has dried up to a sad little trickle. In our previously mighty iron mine, only a handful of miners is still active. Let's reclaim all miners which have run out, so we can repurpose them at our future iron outpost. Let's go! And the award for the most useless bot in the base goes to... Ahab, that one. Anyway, on our way out, let's make a quick pit stop to also supply the oil outpost with its own repair bot network. Nice. Conveniently, an attack is incoming this very moment. But oh man, my car, it's still outside the walls. And behold the reason why we will not research extra fire damage for a while. Yeah, the bots are still so slow, they would likely die in the fire while repairing the walls. Instead of taking the dangerous direct path, we continue along the northern shoreline and draw the power line out further to the second oil patch, before dropping down towards the iron ore patch. Here we use the long distance power lines to make as few obstructions in the way of any biter pathfinding as possible. Hopefully they will leave the power lines alone. Unfortunately the giant northern biter nest is way too close by in order for us to be able to claim the entire iron patch. We don't want our flamethrowers drawing non-stop oil draining attention from the biters. At least not yet. So we stay as far south as possible, while still claiming more than enough of the iron patch to supply our current needs. After we define our perimeter, we lay down our first rail track. The rumors are true, there's gonna be trains. But before we build anything that may trigger the biters, we first wall off our area. Though we may have bitten off too large of a chunk of the iron ore patch. The northern flamethrowers range is still pretty close to the nest. Anyway, how does the train get through the wall whereas the biters cannot? Well, with a gate obviously.
We then use the car to go and scout out the best part for our rail line. And pick up the previously prepared oil barrels from our base. It seems like the rail will be able to fit in without any problems. Good. Now, this is probably not the intended way of using a fluid wagon on a train, but oh well. Anyway, now that we have oil on location, and because I pre-placed all the pipeworks, the flamethrowers are immediately fueled upon placement, and ready to deal with any biters. Two roboports cover the entire outpost for repairs by bots, but since there's nothing in their contract obstructing us from giving them additional tasks, we may as well force them to do our... Uh, I mean delegate to make the bots build the mine for us. The train fills up with iron ore for the very first time. Which is already enough to anger the biters on all sides. And they are gathering for the attack. In a moment of brightness, I decide to go lay out the train tracks from inside our train, so we can make a quick getaway if we trigger any nearby biters. Meanwhile at the base, some spitters are attacking our vital oil pipeline, but there's no need to rush in ourselves. We can just leave some instructions for our bots and continue with our own project. Good job guys! <sighs> Here we immediately see the reason we don't want to further increase our fire damage. Perhaps getting the first two levels of bot flight speed will help. This looks like a tight spot to squeeze ourselves through without alerting either the gathering biters on the left or the nest bound biters on the right side. Still, we have our train for a quick getaway. I have way too much faith in thinking I know the trigger distance of the biters. 
We are cutting it really thin here, so naturally I go ahead and take my eyes off the life threatening situation for extended amounts of time, to explore the optimal position of the rail line on the map view. Well, our overconfidence goes unpunished this time, but if we keep doing dumb stuff like this, the odds will catch up to us sometime. Anyway, here is the reason why it's a good idea to pre-align your builds to the rail grid ahead of time, if you intend on using trains. I didn't, and now the walls are one tile misaligned to be able to make the corner. The problem is, you usually build your walls and base before being able to even craft rails. So since this alignment mishap, I now carry a blueprint of a single rail piece in my blueprint book, which allows me to align my early game builds to the rail network, instead of making eye-tearing monstrosities like this gate. Anyway. Now that we have bots to immediately repair any wall damage, we can safely reduce the number of walls again. The extra layers were only there so I could focus on other projects for a decent amount of time before I had to interrupt my building business to attend to the wall. Still, even with the quad wall, I couldn't take my eyes off the wall for long enough as it turned out. With the home station built for the iron train, we rush back to the iron outpost in our trusty tch. And after connecting the locomotive back to the cargo wagons, we can automate iron ore delivery into our base. And soon, we can enjoy two full belts of iron plates again. <sighs> now with a fresh new iron supply for our base, we can start researching again. One of the first things on our list is the power armor, as well as the logistics bots technology, or as I like to call it, the triple toolbar technology, as it gives us 30 extra pseudo inventory slots to carry stuff around. The spare of victorious victories of getting to bots and claiming our first iron outpost warrants a joyful celebration right here under the tree of sadness. Now, I'm normally the kind of guy to put the very effective and powerful efficiency modules in my miners, which easily cuts base pollution, biter attacks and biter evolution speed in half, but in this playthrough they are forbidden. Instead, why not put speed modules in these stone miners instead? The stone patch is smack in the middle of my planned base building area, so let's clear it out 60% faster and with 150% extra pollution. In this playthrough, on a treeless desert map, we want to experience the full wrath of the pollution based biter attacks. And look at that pollution raging on the map. Many of the biter nests are completely surrounded, and no matter how hard they try to suck it in, they just can't handle my pollution.
Well, we are surely not done claiming resources and we need to hurry up a little with that too, as at over 60% evolution, small biters have become a memory of the past and biter expansions will be popping up everywhere in quick succession. So, after building this quick temporary setup to get us the blue chips we need for the power armor, we prepare yet another batch of electric engines and robot frames. Before discovering the other disadvantage of not using efficiency modules. Without their power consumption reduction, our single steam engine array is at the limit of its capabilities. The supply of barreled oil for the flamethrowers at the iron outpost won't last forever, so before we forget, we automate oil delivery to the iron outpost. Now, in a normal game I would just belt the iron back to the base, but with the indestructible biter bases spawning biters all around, a train offers me a way to personally speed through the wastelands, hopping from outpost to outpost through the ever enclosing biter landscape out there. While they trigger on my presence, the train easily outspeeds the biters, unless… Well, we'll get to that later. Hmm, well somehow I disconnected the entire furnace area. That is the curse of wooden power poles. Usually half of them function as a single point of failure for the base's entire power supply. Anyway, the triple toolbar tech terminates its tacking. And we can enjoy 30 extra inventory slots to carry those obscure things you need only once in a blue moon. But the moon above this planet of Novice here seems to be blue every time you're out somewhere far away from your base. So until we actually start using logistics robots, I can safely carry all that stuff in my logistics trash slots. And we won't be caught out missing some gates for the train to pass through or something similar. Having skipped the modular armor completely, we head over to the spaceship and fill its last inventory slot with our old trusty heavy armor. Because it is time. Time for the power armor. We still need to research some accompanying technologies to make the most out of it though. The power armor grants us yet another 20 inventory slots, meaning our total carry capacity has increased by over 50%. We will power the power armor with portable solar panels and we need 30 personal batteries to make 3 Mark II batteries, which have a whopping 5 times the capacity for the same footprint. We do need a handful of low density structures for those as well though. As always, a temporary setup will get any small job done. Then we find out the disadvantage of trains over belts. Yeah, iron ore on belts does not interact with biters crossing through, whereas a train very clearly does. On the other side of the coin, rails are fireproof while the flamethrowers will burn belts to a crisp, so we will stick with the train approach for now.
what we can try is upgrade the train fuel to rocket fuel. With 180% acceleration rate, that will give it just a little extra oomph to speed through a blob of biters blocking the rails. It would be even better if we could afford two locomotives on each end, but we just don't have the available parking space for such a long train. Now driving on rocket fuel, the train enjoys a higher top speed as well as much stronger acceleration. Which means it will take a lot more biters to bring the train to a full stop as they did before. Hopefully it will help. While we are out there, we supply some replacement items for the bots and upgrade the train loading to stack inserters. With stack size 4, they're only at a third of their end game power level, but still, they are twice as fast as fast inserters at this point. After our personal batteries and roboports have charged up, we are finally ready to insert the exoskeletons. And what a difference in running speed it is! Oh yes! Now that we have somewhat successfully secured the iron source, it is time to go and try to claim the copper before it is swamped in biter expansions. So we grab some stuff and try to sneak out in our own personal locomotive without being crushed by the giant iron train. On the way out we draw a backup power line out to the iron as to not have a single point of power failure for the outpost. Well, it turns out the big bad iron train isn't going to make it out here to run me over. In fact, it looks like it got blocked by biter activists yet again. Oh man, the train got wrecked twice already in such a short time span. This is not a good sign for the rest of the playthrough. The train got wrecked twice already in such a short time span. This is not a good sign for the rest of the playthrough. How the heck are we supposed to transport all from the outpost to the base then? Boat belts and trains turn out to be an unreliable way and don't even get me started about bots. They'll fly straight over the cuckoo's nest and get absolutely obliterated together with whatever they're carrying. Shh. 
sort of personally carrying home vast amounts of ore myself by making thousands upon thousands of walking trips, which I am not going to by the way, I'd rather build a dragon tea designed by hand, the question remains, how can we solve this problem? I see only one solution, but oh my, it's a crazy one. And perhaps solution is a bit of an overstatement for what I have in mind, if we can pull it off at all that is. I wouldn't know, I haven't tried this before, and I don't think anyone has. Whatever it is, and if it turns out to be doable, we will have to find out next time.